Hebrews 12? Yeah. Beginning in verse 25, it says, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? In other words, God is speaking to you, church. And he's telling you to be cautious of certain things. D don't ignore it. Hear the word of the Lord. Verse 26. At that time, his voice shook the earth. This is speaking about when God spoke from, from Sinai, from Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb, as it's called. And his voice, it says in Exodus, shook the earth. It says, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Verse 27, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. Listen, there's a shaking going on in the earth. I mean, can you possibly deny it? And the purpose it says here in verse 27, is the removing of that which can be shaken. Listen, if you've got a tree where some of the leaves on it have turned brown and the rest of them are nice and green and healthy, if you grab a hold of that tree and shake it, all those dead leaves are going to fall to the ground. That's exactly what the Lord is about to do in this earth. This stuff that's going on right now, it can't last much longer. Amen. There are Christians, children of God, Christians, Jews, that are being persecuted. And God is not going to tolerate it. It can't last much longer. Amen. And there's going to be a shaking in this earth, which I believe may have already begun. But it's only those who are dead spiritually or those who are are malnourished spiritually, or those that are loosely connected spiritually, that will be shaken from the tree. Again, verse 27, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is, created things. It's very important that we realize what God is getting at here. Created things. So that what cannot be shaken may remain. Hear me when I tell you that if you're connected, well connected, well fed by the Lord, you can't be dislodged from his kingdom. Verse 28, therefore, since we, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken... Let us be thankful and so worship God um, acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God, it says in 29, is a consuming fire. Church, the phrase, hearing him who speaks, is a reference to not only hearing God, but heeding what he says. It, we've got to stop. We have this tendency not everybody, but some of us have a tendency of going to church to fulfill an obligation. And in our mind, we'll sit and we'll suffer through it because that's what we're supposed to do. And everything that's said for, directly from the word of God, in some cases, goes in this ear, passes out that one, and just keeps on going. But this isn't the purpose. The Lord is, he has men and women in ministry sharing his word that you can not only hear it, but receive it. Amen. That means embrace. Listen, it would be like if all the food you put in your mouth, you just spit out. <laughs> First, you want to chew it, mm, and then you can get the flavor out of it, and then you can swallow it so it fills your belly, so you get a certain satisfaction. I know I do. If I kill a couple of cheeseburgers, I'm happy. <laughs> it's just as imperative that we 
hear and obey and live by his word today as it was for the Israelites back at, at Mount Sinai. Listen, there were many that perished that didn't heed the word of God. When Moses came down, they were in the midst of a, a big party. They had a golden calf. This is after God delivered his Ten Commandments. You see, sometimes humanity doesn't embrace the Word of God. It literally passes in one ear and out the other. And God is concerned with that. He says, no, you can't afford to live that way right now. He says, I'm sending you my word. I'm trying to open your eyes to a danger that's, that's coming against the entire world. Open your eyes. Verse 26, he said, at that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he's promised, once more will I shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And this term, once more, indicates the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Friends, I believe that this global shaking has begun. God is shaking loose the ungodly, so that the people of faith may remain standing. Amen. That's the title of today's message. Standing in a shaky world. Listen to me, every one of you, God loves you so much. If you were the only face left on this earth, He'd go to the cross again, just for you. Thank God he doesn't need to. It's one sacrifice. It's all we needed. And in verse 28, it says, Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. You see, one of the things we need to do is finally declare, what kingdom are you a part of? You know, we're either part of the kingdom of this world or we're part of the kingdom of God. And, and we've got to stop trying to walk that, that fine line in between them. Hear me when I tell you that there's nothing in that world that's going to benefit you. Nothing. Church, Those of us that have a now faith. You know, Hebrews 11, one says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Well, that's speaking about having a faith to take a promise made for the future and bringing it into you now. Listen, if you're not feeling well, and the word of God says in was it 2 Peter 2.24? That by his stripes you were healed. That's something that's already taken place, but you need to apply it in you now. Amen. Because you got symptoms in your body now. Amen? Amen? And God wants you to apply the promise, the word, to your now situation. So, for those of us that have now faith, we're already living in the kingdom of God, which cannot be shaken. Thy kingdom come. What? Where? You know, when, think about that. Jesus was asked, what should we pray? And Jesus said, pray to the Father that thy kingdom come. Jesus encourages us to pray that the kingdom of heaven manifest itself on earth. As David said in Psalm 27, what would have become of me had I not expected to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living? Oh yeah, there's no question that we have a wonderful inheritance when we get to heaven. 
But we don't have to live like we're in hell now. Not when Jesus said, believe, pray to the Father that his kingdom will come now. So what does that mean to you? That means that you can walk in victory in your now. That means you don't have to suffer poverty and lack now. There's no poverty in heaven. There's no sickness in heaven. There's no grief. There's no sorrow. There's no weeping. There's no tears in heaven. And all of those things that heaven is can be part of your now. Hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, come on, don't you love it? Well, some of you do. Praise God. Some of you are not so sure. Trust me when I tell you, it's better in your now than in your future. Amen? But church, how could this be? How? How could this be possible that we could be so different, so blessed in comparison to a world that's so troubled? Well, let me share this with you from Luke chapter 6. Beginning in verse 46, it says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? That's Jesus speaking. Why why do you call me your Lord? If you you ignore what I say to you, if if you let it pass in one ear and out the other without clinging to some gray matter. In verse 47, he says, I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. Listen, this is going to show, it's going to illustrate the difference between two different kinds of people. The person who hears the word, applies the word, and lives the word. As opposed to the person that lets it go in one ear and out the other. The person who hears his words and puts them into practice, in verse 48 he says, He's like a man building a house, who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it, because it was well built. Verse 49, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like the man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Church, there's a shaking going on. The world is being shaken at its very roots. Hebrews 12 and 27, these words keep coming back to me. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. It says, that is created things. This created things is speaking of man-made creation, not God-made creation. So that what cannot be shaken may remain. You know what this, I believe, is speaking of? It's speaking of man-made systems of worshiping God that are drawing men away from individual personal relationship with the Lord and trying to put them into a system defined by men of how to approach God Almighty. Church, God is looking for people that truly connect with him on a personal, individual basis. He he wants to be your God. He doesn't want to just be the God. But he wants to be your personal Lord and Savior. Friends, while the world falls apart around us, let us 
be looking at and looking to that which cannot be shaken. I, I can't help myself, i got to read Psalm 91. If this doesn't encourage you, then you need to check your pulse. Now, this is God sharing his heart. And you're going to see, when, and I'll show you where it happens, where, I mean, here the psalmist is talking about what God is doing for him, but it reaches a point where it changes person. Where now it's God speaking about what he's going to do for you. So it's no longer hypothetical, it's now purely factual. You, you with me? You follow me on this? Yes. Psalm 91, beginning in verse, again, this is from the NIV. It says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Now, you know where that is? It's that place called relationship with him. And it says, whoever dwells in that shelter. Dwell means to live, to remain, to continue there. It says that that person will rest. You know, when a person has no rest, they have no peace. There's unrest in their soul. There's turmoil. They're troubled. And all the money in the world can't buy that peace. It can't buy that rest. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. The person that really knows the Lord, loves the Lord, serves the Lord, walks with the Lord. This is going to be what's in their heart. God is my refuge. No matter what's going on in the world, I have a safe place. That's called in him. Amen? Verse 3, surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. The devil is always laying traps to try to catch you or I. And this says that surely he will save you. Who will save you? The Lord. He's going to save you from that snare. Listen, verse 4, he will cover you. God is, says I'm, he's going to put a protective covering over you. Does this sound too good to be true? With a natural mind, it probably is. But we're talking about a supernatural God with a supernatural love for for his children. Wouldn't you protect your child? I mean, if there were a branch falling from the tree, wouldn't you jump in a way to shield your child? Of course you would. Well, God is not saying anything that any other parent wouldn't say. He's going to protect you. He's going to save you. He's going to cover you. Verse 5. You will not fear. Say that with me. I will not fear. It says that you won't fear the terror of night. Nor the arrow that flies by day. Nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. Nor the plague that destroys at midday. Now listen to this, church. It says, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Is that amazing? I mean, there's a thousand laying down dead over there and there's 10,000 all over the ground over there and here you stand saying, I'm fine. Verse 8 says, you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. The nearest you're going to get to it, to the terror, to the sickness, to the pestilence, to to everything that's coming against you to kill you, the nearest you're going to get is within eyesight. You're going to see it happening to the wicked that surround you. But there you stand. Say this with me. Say, I'm I'm unshakable. unshakable. 
That's the word for today. Remaining stable in a shaky world. Verse 10. It says, no harm will overtake you. Praise God. Then it says, no disaster will come near your tent or your home. Now, here's where this suddenly takes a change of person. Where now it's no longer the psalmist speaking about what God will do for him. It's God saying what he will do for the psalmist and you. Verse 14. Because he loves me, says the Lord. So what is the one criteria? You got to love the Lord. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. No matter what's going on in this world, he's going to rescue you. No matter what's happening on your block, no matter what's happening at your right hand or your left hand, he's going to rescue you. He says, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. Verse 15, he will call on me, and I will answer him. Don't you? you got to love that. When you call on God, he's going to answer you. I will be with him in trouble. Listen, when you're going through stuff, and there's some stuff in every life, isn't there? <laughs> have peace in knowing that you're not going through the stuff alone fear not for I shall be with thee saith the Lord that's Isaiah 43 and verse 1 fear not no matter what you're going through whether it's just little waters whether it's a river or even if you're going through a fire he says fear not for I shall be with thee Psalm 91 lists some of the benefits of, of being relationally connected to the Lord. And in that place, we find ourselves safe and secure in the midst of general chaos, huh? But friends, Jesus opened the door for our restoration with the Father. Even better, Jesus is the door to our relationship with the one true God. By his entry into Jerusalem, as I said earlier, we now have entry into heaven. And it's all by him. It's all through that door. Jesus said, I am the door. He said, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Church, it's, it's time for a very fundamental shift. A fundamental return to the pure worship of Jesus Christ. Friends, we need a worship free of religious tradition and ceremonialism. We need a worship established by and motivated by personal, intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with he who suffered and died for you. Church, it's time that, that we return to the rock that was given to us by God the Father. You want to hear something interesting? I'm going to start to close with this thought. In Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, it says, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin. Isn't that an interesting name? A desert of sin. Traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They encamped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, what do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? Verse 3, but the people were thirsty for water there. And they grumbled against Moses. They said, why do you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? 
Verse 4, then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're, they're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff which you struck the Nile with and go. Verse 6, I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. God said, if you go believing, if you go expecting, I'm going to be there. And where did he tell him to go? He told him to go to the rock. Now listen, he didn't just tell him to go to the rock, then he said, smite the rock. Now you know what smite means? Hit it. Take that staff I gave you and clobber that rock. He said, strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. Friends, this rock had to be struck. Just as Jesus had to be struck for us. And isn't it interesting that from that rock came that which would sustain the life of the nation of Israel. Water. And to this day, for those that go to Jesus, surrendering, submitting, believing, expecting that they too will find living waters that never cease to flow. No matter what may be occurring around you, you can and will stand firm in a shaky world. Church, don't fear the things you see going on in this world. Pray. Pray about them. For every beheading, there's not only one victim, there's a whole family of victims left behind. Pray. Pray for God to send one warring angel. God sent one warring angel into the camp of the Assyrians. And in one night, one warring angel slew 187,000 men. All God needs to do is dispatch Gabriel or dispatch Michael. And this thing is over. The shaking will be done. That which is dead will have fallen to the earth. And those who live in Christ shall stand and remain forever. Church, you're the light of this earth. You're the salt of the earth. You're the apple of God's eye. Say this with me. Say, glory be to God. Would you all stand?